Okay, we're good to go. So today's going to mark the start of a series of six interviews that we'll be doing leading into the Summer Guitar Festivals in BC this year. We'll be having two interviews per week with the faculty of the Okanagan and Vancouver Guitar Festivals. Uh, they'll be set for July 4th to 7th and 11th to 14th, respectively. And there's some really, really renowned guitarists in the bunch, so you won't want to miss any of the interviews. Two of them will actually be uh, my old professors from university, so that'll be pretty interesting. And uh, Louise also studied with them too, so it'll be, uh, it'll be cool to hear what they have to say. But anyways, without further ado, why don't we kick things off on a high note with Luis. Our guest today, uh, Luis Medina, one of my good friends from all the way back in university almost 10 years ago when we were both studying as undergrads at UBC. And now he's the founder of the Vancouver Classical Guitar Festival, as we just mentioned, coming up in July. Currently professor at Capilano University and soon to be a doctor of music from University of Toronto. So yeah, it's really exciting to have you on. Thanks, TA. Wow, like it seems like you really did your homework there, huh? Yeah. Oh like, well, yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I got yeah. gotta got to butter up the me. guests, you know. <laughs> Make them feel nice before they start. That's right. That's nice. Yeah. So I wanted to start the interview today with just a little bit about you and your current projects and then some more general things about guitar and things in Canada, and then we'll finally round things off with the guitar festival that you're involved with, and then maybe some viewer questions at the very end. Very cool. Sounds good. All right. So just like every interview we do on this channel, we're going to start with the most serious, 100% difficult question first, which is, um, what what do you do to maintain that wonderful mustache? Do you do anything specific? <laughs> Wax it? Oh, gosh. that You're right. This is like the most serious, most important question. Yeah. Everyone needs I get to know. All the time. Yeah. It's really... It, the, the answer is really annoying. I don't do anything. Like really? I literally just don't touch it. Um, if anything, I just kind of like twirl it with my fingers uh -huh. a little bit like uh -huh. that. And that's kind of it. Like I have wax, but I don't really use it. Wow. Um, the joke is that I have very curly hair. Uh -huh. Just not too much evidence to prove it. <laughs> except for this. Right. But no, seriously, I don't do anything. I just don't cut it. And I just, um, I, I wake up like this. Wow. Just blessed you know? with superior <laughs> genetics. Got it. <laughs> you were meant never, to be a... i didn't even think that this was gonna happen ever yeah i didn't want to actually i was very much against it yeah. well it's a good look it's very uh spanish guitar you know perfect speaking of which uh so i remember your uh -huh. doctorate being about uh discovering some of the hidden gems in mexican classical guitar and specifically with uh julio cesar oliva please fix my pronunciation if i Good enough. Okay. Uh, so, but but you're right. You're right. Um, so my doctorate. I mean, I can't say that I discovered him in like in the slightest. Mm -hmm. He's already very well. I mean, so his name is Julio Cesar Oliva. Okay. Um, he's based in Mexico City. He was born and raised like he's been his entire career in Mexico City. So mm -hmm. he still resides there. Um, and I've known of him for many years, mm -hmm. but mainly through his. I got to know of him first through his arrangements of mariachi music for okay. classical guitar. I, I remember listening to it when, like, it was one of the first things that I listened to when I started picking up the guitar, because my PE teacher came up to me one day and he was like, buddy, can you tell if this is two or three guitars playing? And I was like, well, I don't know, let me check. So I, I borrowed the CD mm -hmm. and I went home and I couldn't tell. I was blown away by how complex it sounded. Um, and then maybe a couple months after that, just Googling, uh, arrangements of mariachi music for guitar, I came across a file that matched all the titles of the CD and then some. And I couldn't, even, I could hardly even read it then or play it. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple of months to, you know, improvise, like improve just enough to actually read through them badly, if anything, but enough to recognize that they were exact, the exact arrangements yeah. of the CD. So that's when I realized that, oh my gosh, it's like, this is actually just one guitar. Wow. And that's the only time that I had the answer because it just didn't make sense to me. And then I realized that all of those arrangements were made by Julio Cesar Oliva. Mm -hmm. So he's very well known in Mexico is my point. Um, but he's very, he's very obscure outside of Mexico. Yeah. Um, and I feel like even people that know who he is, like because everybody knows who he is in Mexico, classical guitarists know who he is. 
I don't know how many people know the extent of his compositional career. Everybody knows that he's a composer, yeah. but I don't know how many people know that he's written over 300 pieces of music at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and all for guitar. Yeah, that's really impressive. Honestly, like I, I feel like I know a decent amount of classical composers, but I, I honestly hadn't heard of him until, uh, until I found out from you. So, yeah, <laughs> right. so it's it's working. Your <laughs> your project is uh, yeah, freaking well known. I would hope so. Yeah, I would hope so. I last year I gave a lecture about him and his life at the Toronto Guitar Weekend, mm -hmm. the same weekend that David Russell came to perform at the at the weekend, and I remember there was like maybe. 25 people in the conference room when I was giving the lecture and I asked who here knows the name Julio Cesar Oliva and like two people raised their hands and I was like hey, who here that doesn't know me from school know the name <laughs> and then yeah hands went down because yeah. that's kind of like at least in, uh, here in Toronto very few people know the name like mm -hmm. very few and most of them at this point is because I've mentioned it yeah or played his music straight up mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's still, it's still very obscure. Hopefully we can keep changing that. Yeah. Are there any other composers that are kind of like in your, uh, in your sights or, uh, are you just mostly focused on this single composer? What, what, what made you settle on, on, on him specifically? I don't really know. I mean, I know of other names that are just really not as well known in, outside of Mexico mm -hmm. that I think are worthy of mention like this. Gerardo Tamés, there's, um, I'm blanking his name right now. Um, he's a little bit more well-known, fun, funny enough. Anyway, so there's a number of Mexican guitars mm -hmm. that are actually like worthy of, of knowing and playing their music. Um, why him? I, I feel like I have a special connection with him because that's one of the first, you know, one of the first composers that I got to know about. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the fact that he's so obscure. Yeah. The fact that so few people know about him makes me want to try and help out and just make his music more known and honestly from from the music perspective i just really love his music um he describes it himself as his effort to bring in to force in fact he tries to force um impressionistic idioms and romantic idioms into the guitar mm -hmm. um he feels that there's not in like we don't have a composer that wrote like Debussy on the guitar, and he tries to bring that in, like Ravel, Schumann, all of his biggest uh, influences, he tries to fit it into the instrument. So in that sense, his music is also unique. Yeah, no, um, great. And so th there's all kinds of music. I mean, when you write 300 pieces, there, there's going to be a lot of variety yeah, in sure. terms of styles that you're going to cover. Um, and But nevertheless, one of those styles is, of course, highly influenced by Mexican folk music. And it's always great to be able to play music that I feel a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, culturally connected to. And was there anything surprising that you learned during the process of going through all his works and and digging out all the uh, all the good details about him? It's yes, definitely. Um, in terms of like, I haven't had a chance to explore even a quarter of the music because mm -hmm. most of these 300 pieces tend to be anywhere between seven to 20 minutes long. Wow. Okay. It, yeah. No, th we're talking about like big pieces. Yeah, right? yeah. Every, any one piece is a major endeavor. Um, so that in itself is a challenge. The other challenge that very few, very few things of, by him are actually published. So that makes it harder to find. Mm -hmm. And some have made it into the internet. Uh, you can find some handwritten uh, scores by him that are just somebody scanned and did the world a favor by putting them on, on online. Yeah. Um, but even then, I don't think, I wouldn't say that more than 50 of his pieces are like available anywhere. Wow. Okay. So those other 200 or more are, to my understanding, I, I've, I, I'm in communication with him. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that his music is in his file, on his cabinet file. So he's he has it. Mm -hmm. One time I asked him if I could get a copy of his guitar concerto that he wrote for guitar orchestra and guitar solo. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that it's just too many pages and there's no way. <laughs> I would have to go in person right. to Mexico to scan all the documents and then bring them over. Do you have any plans Which to do that? I, I really hope I can. I haven't had a chance. The doctorate has been kicking my butt yeah. a little bit. Um, organizing the festival and between mm -hmm. organizing the festival, making a living, and doing a doctorate degree, it's been a little difficult to find yeah, uh, yeah. the means 
or the time to get down to Mexico City. But I will. I'm really hoping that I can do that. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, as soon as like as soon as this year. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Speaking of which, I, I had a question. So, um, about time it's right now between the professorship and your private students and the research you're doing and your own practicing and performing and all the traveling because you're having to go back and forth between Toronto and Vancouver all the time. Uh, there's probably like zero time in the day at all. So is there anything that you do to manage your time so that you can accomplish all these things and still get like more than four hours of sleep, hopefully? <laughs> well, just sleep less. No, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I try my best. Um, it's honestly challenging. It's not the easiest thing to do. Mm-hmm. I happen to f- somehow manage a balance. Now, in all honesty, between, um, yeah, I guess since the job started in September, since I started teaching at the piano and the flying back and forth started, my practice time has kind of like mm-hmm. taken a hit a little bit. So instead of, you know, I, I really like uh, to hit at least four hours of practicing every day. Yeah. Um, I think I managed at the most three. And when everything comes together because it you have periods right Mm -hmm. where everything really gets busy where you know students uh in in vancouver are having exams or festivals or performances that i require me to be more on top of uh, that um my own assignments are around the same amount of time so with with all with all of that happens i think i don't think i can manage to practice more than two hours a day yeah yeah um so that that's kind of the one that takes the, the biggest hit um in fact I feel like I started to feel the consequences of this towards the end of April. And now that it's been, I've had a month since school kind of ended, mm-hmm. that I've been kind of back on the saddle with practicing, that I'm like, oh, you know, you know what? I can actually play this damn thing. So great. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, it's honestly, I, 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 uh, it's a bit of a struggle, Yeah. but somehow it works. Is there anything that you do to make use of the time that you spend traveling back and forth? Read read a lot <laughs> like, like for instance for one of my seminars for my seminars in classes um i just either i use my time on the plane to catch up on sleep mm-hmm. or uh to read to read assignments to read uh, to have readings we have uh, at least for the seminars that i have it's very typical to have three readings every week yeah do and each of those readings is going to be anywhere between 30 to 50 pages mm-hmm. So it's just a lot of reading and making sure that on my downtime, it's not actually scroll time. It's yeah, yeah. Like grab the thing and just read as much as we can, take notes. Um, it's It was particularly tricky on, I, I would typically teach at least this term since uh, January started. I was teaching at Capilano on Mondays mm-hmm. and then I would fly back to Toronto uh, on Monday evenings around maybe <laughs> 10, 30 or 11 right. p.m. Because I had class in Toronto at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. That sounds terrible. <laughs> wow. It was a little bit rough. Yeah. So I would sleep wherever I could on the plane mm-hmm. or I would just read. I would get to the, I would basically just get, be able to get home around 8 a.m., mm-hmm. um, shower, eat something, keep reading, and then go to class. Yeah, that's, that's not a fun schedule. It, it was it wasn't it was <laughs> fine though yeah i mean the crazier thing i think is that it became normal mm-hmm. like it was part of the schedule i was like okay and, and but luckily because it's every two weeks it gives me time to catch up with everything else yeah. uh con- and including sleep because sleep there's no way that you anybody can survive without enough sleep yeah I think. for sure how about uh, mental practice or score practice do you like believe in that or do you do any of that during your downtime as well Absolutely. I definitely believe in it. I feel like I don't do enough of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it really comes down to like, I have a performance and I don't have access to my instrument, I will simply just review all the pieces mm-hmm. uh, with as much, de- I will try to reconstruct as much detail as possible uh, as I go through it. And if at some point I get a little bit stuck, that's when I might even like open the score, mm-hmm. and remember what it's like, and then reconstruct it again, just like, you know, rehearsing it in my own head, but with as many details, that'd be right hand fingering, left hand fingering, dynamic, contact point, preparation, making sure that I'm thinking ahead of time, like, and I can almost reconstruct the next moment while I'm thinking of something else. 
but yeah, absolutely. I would like to make a habit of doing it more. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I think last year was one of the best examples of me using men like men mental practice. Um, before the Okanagan Festival last year, um, I had to move back to Vancouver. So of course, moving, it's a little tricky. Mm -hmm. And then it was Lucida's birthday. So we had to, you know, take care of that and make sure that, you know, my lady had a really fun time. Yeah. Um, we had a barbecue, just, there was no time to practice very, very much. And I think between my last performance and the Okanagan, I don't think I got more than three hours of practicing Oh wow! with the instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, but you bet that on my uh, flying to Vancouver and the drive, luckily I wasn't driving. Don't do this while you're driving. <laughs> um, on the drive to the Okanagan, I remember telling, uh, Lucia, <laughs> it would be like, almost ceremonious so i'll be like okay just you know what give me five minutes i'm just gonna run through a piece and i would like, just sit back on the car and like some like at times she would even provide me her hand and now <laughs> make sure that i can like move my hand around the That's way funny and i mean i warmed up i practiced a little bit i warmed up the next day i had a spicy burrito i think that was a key yeah and i feel like that was one of the best performances that i've given wow like not perfect necessarily but just like you know, like on the saddle, exciting sound, mm -hmm. loud. It was really good. Nice. And I think it has to do a lot with uh, with just putting so much effort into thinking about the piece. Really nice. When you're doing your mental practice, are you also envisioning like yourself on the stage, kind of simulating that performance environment, or is it just mostly about the music and the piece itself? I think it's mostly of the music and the and, and the piece, and like in the technical requirements and mechanical mm -hmm. aspects of the piece. Um, I think I should do more envisioning myself in the concert hall. I do that on occasion. Um, I think I just don't have a habit of doing that, yeah. but I would imagine it would be really helpful too. Cool. Okay. So I'm curious about your professorship at Kaplan University. Uh, it's really congratulations that you got it. Uh, I'm curious, what was the process like when you were applying for it? Like what kind of thing did you have to do? What kind of auditions and requirements and and what was the whole thing like let me try to remember it was a little bit um challenging because uh at first so the position opened up officially last summer mm -hmm. um and i applied and i sent all my documents around this time of the year i think um but i don't know if you heard but capilano university staff administration was on strike okay for months like for months so any one given administrative process hiring uh, additions, uh, admissions, anything essentially came to a halt. Okay. Um, so what happened is that I didn't hear anything. And then around July, no, maybe at the very end of July, I heard back saying that we're not going to be able to essentially do the official position. We'll have to wait until the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but then they still want, were wondering if I would be interested in taking the job, even if it's just as a, as a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, of course, um, and that's when the flying started. When it was official, uh, when it opened up in the fall officially, so of course you have to send your CV, a portfolio, samples of your performance, cover letter. I can't remember if it was, uh, of course, recommendation letters. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it feels very standard in that yeah, sense, yeah. except you know our portfolio is mostly videos. Um, once they see like materials, it doesn't have to just be videos. Once they see that you, you know, you have the capability, then they interviewed a couple, uh, I guess, applicants. Mm -hmm. And at that point it involved, uh, an interview with the Dean and the other heads of the music department and, uh, teaching demonstration. So there was a student who came in to just, you know, have a lesson in front of the uh, right. hiring committee. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the process. It was in some ways very straightforward. Yeah, yeah, that sounds very standard, actually. I thought it would be a lot more mysterious yeah. than that. No, I don't, I mean, it was funny. <laughs> it was like, it, there was no like, you know, musicianship test or like transcription yeah, or arrangement yeah. test on the spot. It's like, hey, do an arrangement of this now. <laughs> no, 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 that. Right. like no sight reading involved. Mm -hmm. It was just, can you teach? what are your what's your experience and what are your thoughts oh, cool that's basically it yeah. um, what are your philosophies in teaching and all yeah. these kinds of things 
And how does it feel teaching at the university compared to your studio or private teaching? Is there any differences? Um, in some ways, no. It's very similar. Um, as you as you know yourself, um, guitar skills, playing music, is very independent. As it, it doesn't have to be attached to a uh, university. Yeah. Right? If you're doing physics you would like to be in an institution that has the resources to you know do research in that field for music because it's such a it's it's in itself uh such a human activity mm -hmm. you can find it very much outside of it so point being i you know i am used to dealing with very high level students of all kinds of ages and backgrounds that could very well if they chose to pursue a career the difference with the university is precisely that, that they have essentially, once they enter the university, is because they are more certain of wanting a career mm -hmm. in music right. than maybe teaching, performing. And from that, I think the perspective changes because it's not so much about just enjoying the act of making music at whatever you know level of proficiency you want. Once you enter the university, it's the, uh, I think that it changes into well, what are, what tools do you need to make a career out of this? Yeah. Because I mean, we all know that it's not the easiest career to make a, you know, to make a living out of. Um, so you want to have the best tools at your disposal. That I mean, so you can be a good teacher, so you can go be a good performer, so that you can be a good chamber musician, like all of these things. So all of it, all of the requirements and expectations kind of like go on steroids. Yeah. To make sure because there's a deadline right like this is what i and i forget about this but i think students at the university because it really it's only two terms a year out of three mm -hmm. um they only get somewhere around 27 lessons mm -hmm. 50 minute lessons which come down to maybe 23 or 24 hours of lessons a year that's not that much yeah yeah um, so it's it's kind of tricky in that sense. So you want to try to, at least when I'm with them, I try to give them just as much information, as many tools as they can uh, handle so that they will have and be able to apply those tools when they finish their degrees. That's right, yeah. I think that would be the biggest difference. It's like you only have such a limited time, so you have to give them all the tools they need that they can take to their own private practice and spend like the exactly. majority of their time working by themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, my, my, I think the way that I see it, and this is kind of like a, a flaw of the music system mm -hmm. in itself. Like if you go to, I don't know, math class, how many hours of math do you have uh, with your, like how many hours do you have with your teacher? Four a week? Yeah. More or less? Mm -hmm. It's a considerable amount of time, right? If we can take it with music, it's, one, it's yeah. only one. So when we take, think about it, and the reality is that in math class, the responsibility of, of teaching is still in the classroom time, but then you take that in your responsibilities to absorb it and practice it in your homework outside, however many hours that takes. Mm -hmm. um, when we, I, I like to say that when we put in that like one hour a week perspective, it puts that much greater responsibility on the student mm -hmm. to assimilate those concepts. Yeah, um, sure. it, it makes it trickier. What kind of traits do you see in your most successful students that really sets them apart as, as good learners, maybe gives them more of a chance of assimilating as much of that knowledge as, as possible? Good question. Um, number one, I would say grit. Yeah. Yeah, that would be like a relentless passion and a little and a hint of impatience, just a hint, just a tiny yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Because they, I, I feel like they, they don't want, they should not settle with what they're doing and they want to just, you know, they're thirsty to get it. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, the great to, to not, you know, be demoralized easily when you don't get it. Those are the big, the best combinations because um, I, I find, and that relentless passion of saying like, man, I love this and I just want to, you know, really play it the best I can. Again, perfection, it's a noble, you know, I guess thing to try and attain perfection. We know that that doesn't exist, not because it's impossible, it's because, you know, aesthetics keep changing. Yeah. Like our own personal perspectives and everything, right? Like what I may have called, you know, naively and maybe a little perhaps dumb 
when I was younger, I was like, oh, that was a perfect performance. I would probably listen to it today and be like, what, what was I thinking? Yeah. You know, because yeah. <laughs> the aesthetics has changed that much, mm-hmm. the standards and everything. But those three, I think, are key. Just wanting to stick with it, improve it, especially uh, that, that trying to make it better and take ownership over it so that you want to fix it and improve it on your own time. Um, because if you have all of that, but you're waiting all week to fix something or find a solution or something or improve something until you hear back from your teacher, mm-hmm. it's just going to slow it down. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean that it's impossible. It's just uh, if you want to have a career out of it, that drive is just going to be an like that lack of drive will become an impediment over time. Yeah, nice. I really like that answer. <laughs> So with all the time that you spend around like Canada, Mexico, US, Europe, I'm curious about what your thoughts are about the Canadian classical guitar scene right now, and maybe like specifically Vancouver, Toronto, but just Canada in general, if not. I can't say that I know that much beyond Vancouver and Toronto. Perfect, let's go with that. I see. <laughs> let's start with that, all right? Um, I'd say that it's growing and it's exploding in some really, really cool ways. Um, you know, I... I think I see a lot more guitarists, younger guitarists that are just on their path to be, you know, clear virtuosos of, you know, mm-hmm. in, 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 in every right. Um, and I didn't used to see them. I mean, the, the earliest and kind of the only example of like a super high level guitarist was Alan Liu, yeah. right? Alan. I mean, I remember seeing, I'm, I'm very lucky that I moved to Vancouver when I did because I saw Alan when he was 10 yeah, or yeah. nine years old. I can't remember just shredding it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a thing. You can do that. Right. Um, and like, look at him. He's doing amazing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, in Toronto, there's also other kids who are doing absolutely fantastic. Um, hoping that one of them, like, I think he's going to GFA this year. Wow. For, he wants to try GFA for the youth competition. I hope he makes it to the finals. He has a good chance, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, but there's a lot more kids. Like, it's not just Alan. There's mm-hmm. quite a number of kids on both sides, in all sides of Canada, that are just really, like, getting to some level of proficiency with the instrument at a, a much earlier age. Um, why is that? That is a great question. I think it's just higher quality of teaching, maybe a spread of, uh, of high-quality playing. Mm-hmm that is kind of engaging these younger players to really, you know, grow. I mean, and that's like, if I go to the younger side, what's going on in the universities is quite something. Like yeah. I'm seeing some of the, uh, of the uh, students that are coming into Toronto, for instance, uh, they're playing fantastic. Like they sound like professionals. I don't think I played, I def- I'm pretty sure I didn't play that confidently uh, and that expressively when I was in my undergrad. Yeah, it yeah. took me many years to be able to kind of achieve that level of, of expression and consistency. Do you think- Not to say that I'm like the most consistent or expressive player, let me make that clear. <laughs> but it did take some time to yeah. get it to a level where I feel comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's um, like any anything to do with recent moves to online with so many resources available on the internet, like videos online, performances online, things like that, they're just like raising the standards I think so. I think what happened, so I, somebody should do a paper on this, like a real, you know, mm-hmm. study on this thing. Because from anecdotes from other teachers, like from our teachers, you yeah. know, from Daniel, he would say that, uh, so we saw a huge explosion with Segovia, right? And then we saw Williams and uh, Russell and Barreco come out of sort of like after that generation. Yeah. Um, but we also have to remember that during the time recordings were more available. So it's quite possible that more people were reached by classical guitar music, like high quality classical guitar mm-hmm. music. So that sped up the, um, I guess, how do you call it? The, the uh, diversification process of it. Like there's more people got to know about it. So it's quite likely that the same thing is happening now at an even faster pace because the internet is making everything that much more available Mm -hmm. and not just the internet right like sorry not just like things platforms like spotify and youtube like quick scrolls like instagram tiktok that high level classical guitarists are taking uh, their music to those platforms so you know kids are seeing it it's like oh my god 
that is cool. Yeah, I want to yeah. do it myself, right? So all of that, that environment information might have to do with it. Mm -hmm. It might also have to do with the natural progression that, you know, more people are interested in it, more higher level, you know, performance and teachers come out of it that go out to sort of like the community, the grassroots thing to really teach more students, mm -hmm. right? I think it's a little bit of everything for sure. Like the level is going up, the information is more readily available. Those two, I think in it by themselves are going to do wonders already. Mm -hmm. Plus it's, it's just a matter of time. Classical guitar is the best instrument in the world. Yeah, yeah. Just people have to realize it. <laughs> That's right. Wake up, people. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, speaking of uh, spreading influences and things like that. So this is the fourth year now for the Vancouver Classical Guitar Festival. And, uh, oh, fifth year. Fifth year, I know. Huh. And when it started, it was a fully online event, right? During the during the COVID times? It was. Yeah. I was planning it for an in-person thing, but then COVID had a different plan for us. Yeah. I think that's really unique. I've only seen maybe like one or two other festivals have like like the fully online thing. I don't really see any other festivals uh, doing it since then either. So what was it like setting it up for like planning for the in-person and then having to transition it to uh, being an online only festival? If I'm completely honest with you, I am actually very thankful that they really? went like well, that. Was it easier than you expected? It was so much easier than I expected. I mean, no, nah, it wasn't necessarily easier than I expected. It was simply more manageable. Uh -huh. um, I I don't know, maybe I, I like to think that I'm fairly decent at uh, organizing things. Um, so just having it all run from the computer was, you know, much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, the, and I think not having to deal with the logistics of, um, an in-person festival where you have to move people around, pick people up from the airport that made it easier. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think part of the success of the festival is also the fact that people were kind of stuck at home Yeah. and because it was in, it was online, the prices, I mean, the demand the financial demand or burden of the festival wasn't as high. Yeah. Prices were able to be kept very, very low. Um, the stakes were much lower. And so suddenly I remember the, uh, for the first year I had just invited uh, Daniel to teach because in, in, in all truth, I started the festival mainly for my students. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't have in Vancouver players of the caliber of, you know, Eliana Matos or Daniel. That's right. Or, you know, we don't have a Marchandila. We don't we definitely don't have a Jorge Caballero or a <laughs> Jeffrey McFadden. We just don't have it in Vancouver. Yeah. So the plan for the festival was to essentially convince all my students. At that point, I was teaching 30 students or something. Um, just to get them to have lessons with a very high level teacher so that they would be infused with the passion that I would get from other festivals. Um, everything went online. And suddenly I decided to open it up to just whomever wanted to come and take a master class online or watch a little bit of, you know, playing and listen to lectures and things like that. And suddenly I had no idea that there would be so much interest in Vancouver for people to just take you know, a, a festival. Mm -hmm. So the second year happened and I think we did a, so the plan was to do it in half and half. Yeah. So like in person and live stream it. But very few people were interested in attending in person. So we decided to just do all of the events online, except for the uh, last concert, which we did sort of like a hybrid, right. which was a logistical nightmare, but it worked out fine. And then by the third year, it was in person with live stream. The fourth year was also in person with live stream. This year, we're st sticking in person just because it's a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, we're still debating if we're going to be live streaming the concerts. I don't think we're going to be live streaming the um, the lectures because then it presents all sorts of like logistical nightmares. Right. Um, but I guess to all of this, it was interesting to see the transition to go like planned it in person, go straight online, and then we're kind of like back in person yeah. altogether. Um, it's kind of mind blowing, and every time I am work, we're working on it still. Uh, Lucida is doing a lot more uh, hands on things this year. So we're organizing it together. She's sitting next to me and we're working. And suddenly it's like, oh my God, this is the fifth year. Yeah, it's Crap. incredible. How did that happen? So it's keep, it keeps growing. Now with the uh, 
sponsorship of the uh, of the university mm -hmm. is going to be even better like yeah it's, yeah i'm really excited that we're still like a month and a half away from it and somebody will, like we just sold the first tickets to the concerts nice so i'm really hoping it's going to be a blast mm -hmm. because then if we actually sell so many tickets first of all we can pay faculty much better because uh, i still think even though i we've done the math and we're on the festivals we are on the side that we pay a little bit better than other festivals mm -hmm. um i just i don't think it's like the best i think i would like to try and raise that uh but also if we can prove that we can sell more tickets we might be able to bring even like the, the biggest names that i can think of my dream is that by the 10th year we can bring david russell that'd be amazing that wouldn't that be amazing but yeah. we'll see so baby steps we're trying to this is all new still mm -hmm. um we'll see what happens with that yeah so how do you decide on which faculty you're going to be bringing into the festival the number one thing is are they nice people that's the most important thing i think because um, participants, audiences can notice these things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they're personable. They welcome questions. They welcome comments. They interact with people. So that's the number one thing. Nice. Um, of course, you know they have to be excellent teachers and excellent performers. But I think the number one thing that uh, is that they are like just some of the greatest people that I've known yeah. because that's also like e even if you're like the greatest teacher and the greatest performer but you're not personable all of your teaching is not going to be received mm -hmm. maybe a portion by the people that can you know overlook the uh, you know the negative aspects the negative yeah. reinforcements and whatever the people else with the grid. but exactly mm -hmm. I think a festival organizer was telling me that one of the reasons that David Russell is, for instance, booked so much is, of course, because he's a, one of the greatest guitarists ever. But maybe a little bit more so because he's just a pleasure to work with. Mm -hmm. Like, and people love him. Like, people literally are attracted to him because he has such a wonderful, kind personality. Um, so I I can't agree more that I think the, the number one priority is that are they are the kind people yeah so that's kind of like what i like to go for and they're also just a blast to hang out with They're yeah hilarious. for sure that that should be number two maybe yeah i would i should put expertise a little bit higher than that <laughs> uh but anyway yeah no i think it's it's a really nice feeling especially for these kind of temporary events like when you when you come out of a lesson you just you just feel good because like you learn something and like they, they they lift you up rather than like beat you down even if they're beating you down with good knowledge it doesn't feel good right exactly yeah. they have to beat you up with kindness only. <laughs> that's right yeah. so what were what were some of the challenges with transitioning into in person with the festival and um like was it was it was it hard to maybe get the venue secured or to bring in the faculty from afar compared to having them come online or like what other aspects were were a challenge for creating the festival and getting it all set up i'll i'll tell you that the biggest one for vancouver at least is the rental fees um, for the venues right that's the biggest challenge um renting for anything in vancouver is really quite expensive um, so we have to try and find a middle ground where we can actually afford it. Um, all kinds of, that, that's basically the main one. Um, of course, flying people in and finding accommodations for them. Um, so if anybody has an extra space in Vancouver and they're happy to host some of our faculty, please reach out. We're always happy because some participants, like for instance, right now we have a participant who's flying in from San Francisco, right? Uh, sometimes these are university students who are still, you know, trying to make a career for themselves. They're not in the most secure financial place. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's, you know, happy to host a room for a participant, we'll be more than happy to, you know, to have it. Because my point with all of this is that all of these challenges are best solved with the help of the community. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, in reality, grants, uh, government grants and things like that, they're fantastic. We haven't tapped that too much. We're very happy that this year we're actually getting some 
uh, funding from the BC government, and that is fantastic news. Um, but the more uh, help we can get from the community with these very sort of like tangible things, the richer we can make the festival. Let me like, and, and this is something that I like to highlight because that's the philosophy behind the festival. If we're just trying to make it better for the community. On the first year, we had suddenly so many people uh, registered and essentially there was just more money than we thought we needed. Mm -hmm. So what I ended up doing immediately when I saw that there was like extra money and people still asking to join, I called up Mark Titles. Mm -hmm. and I said, hey, Mark, do you have a stable, you know, internet connection, right. a computer and a webcam and Zoom? And if so, would you like to teach at the festival? And he said, yeah, for sure. So suddenly we were able to, you know, incorporate Mark. Nice. Um, now to, so my, my point with that is that we really try to just make this festival for the community. Mm -hmm. It's really the goal. Um, and I think people see that and that's why it's kind of growing on its own because we're not here to, you know, just, it's definitely not for profit. Yeah. Uh, it's really just in whatever profit is happening, we put it back into the mm -hmm. festival. Um, now, it's about the transition that you asked me about, um, it was mostly like once we figure out the financials of it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's just a lot of work the week of the lead. It's a lot of work leading to yeah. the week of is kind of like most intense. Um, somehow I ended up coming up with a tradition that the director should actually open the festival with a concert. Okay. That doesn't help it, <laughs> but I'm happy to do it anyway. Um, I don't know. It's just, it, it started with this. Like I like to, whenever there's like an open mic mm -hmm. or uh, event that I like to encourage my students to perform, I feel like a hypocrite if I don't play myself. Right. So I figured, okay, guys, you're going to be playing all week. I'm going to play for you. And that's how it started. Nice. Now I'll tell you some of the logistical complications that we've had and one of the reasons that I wanted to bring Ileana back this year is because the first time that we had her in person, I had booked Daniel Bolshoi mm -hmm. and Rene Izquierdo. I don't know if you remember this, but Rene didn't come mm -hmm. because COVID. Yep. Um, he called me up the week, like the, the Monday off, and he's like, I'm really sorry. I'm out. Like, I am so sick. I don't think I'll be fine. Yeah. Like, I'm not even going to test negative for this thing in time. So at that point, we actually called up Ileana, who happened to be in Toronto, and she luckily she wasn't flying anywhere. So we asked her if she could just jump in, and she said, like, sure. So she jumped on a plane, came, performed, and, and taught for the festival. Um, so those are the kinds of logistics that when you're doing things in person, mm -hmm. you have to somehow sort. Yeah, yeah. And we did. That's really good. <sighs> So speaking of the community, um, guitar is a really big community. Uh, classical is not the biggest part of it. So I was wondering, like, how about other styles like finger style, things like that, non-classical? Like, how how do they fit into the festival? Is there is there a space for them? Is it a good fit for for people who are working on that kind of music to to join this festival? To one extent, absolutely. I mean, if somebody's just, it's, this is the thing. Right now, I'm thinking of maybe in the future including more styles of guitar. Uh, at the moment, I think we're just, you know, because it's the thing that we're most comfortable, I'm most comfortable with uh, in terms of networking, in terms of asking uh, guitar teachers to come in and help out. Um, I think that's kind of like been the, mm -hmm. the, the center of it. Um, but it, it is, it, it's a thought that I've considered to sort of like include others at some point in the future, because there's a lot of overlap, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's just, it's a guitar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, now, if there's somebody interested in learning more about classical guitar, that they already have some chops in other styles, I think they will be more than welcome to come here. Uh, depending on which, um, depending on the workshops, some may be a little bit more helpful than others. Um, if they're, because most of them deal with some of these sort of like overlaps. For instance, we'll have the, the first workshop, which I thought was really perfect to start with, is uh, we're inviting Daniel Ramjitan, yep. which I know you know very well. Yes, we'll be interviewing um, him in two days, actually. That's right. Um, and so he's going to come and talk about his expertise on performance anxiety. Because, um, I mean, 
if we're gonna learn about playing guitar and you will in undoubtedly find yourself playing for someone or performing your 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 music mm -hmm. this is kind of like what it's gonna be why we invited him yeah. so that he can come and tell us about strategies and ways to actually handle performance anxiety better and that's how we start and that applies to everybody mm -hmm. doing music for sure so absolutely everybody's welcome and one well two final questions about the festival and uh, while we're talking about this maybe if the viewers have any questions it would be time to start thinking of them and putting them in chat and then we can get Luis to uh, answer some fun viewer questions. Wait, what? There are viewers? I somehow didn't realize. This is oh, live great. streamed and recorded? <laughs> <laughs> oh my bad. Go on. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, two questions. Um, first, uh, do you think that there's a certain skill level that you would need to have in order to benefit from participating in or watching the festival? I like... No. I mean... So a minimum uh, understanding of guitar would be helpful so that you can get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. um, we, like for those who are a little familiar with the Royal Conservatory of Music system, um, I've been telling, the faculty has been asking me this too for their workshop is what kind of level should I be aiming it for? So we're thinking of uh, around level three, level four. Okay. Um, and these are, and, and the reality is that most of these workshops are, concept oriented so it doesn't mean that you have to be able to play the hardest piece in the world to understand it mm -hmm. um, but if you have a better understanding of music notation of some uh, topography of the of the fretboard like know where your notes are more or less you'll be able to follow along more easily mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like so not not like a minimum i would say somebody with uh minimal understanding of the first positions of the fretboard in terms of note reading that would be enough great and final question what do you think is the best thing about these kinds of events like guitar festivals in in general i'll tell you what i think is the best one it's the community coming together providing a space for everybody to know each other um i know that for instance some of the um current board of directors of the Guitar Society, of the Vancouver Classical Guitar Society, they joined after they learned about the festival. And for instance, some of the socials that we had going on for a couple of years before I, I started my doctorate, um, the online socials that came, uh, like those online socials came out of the festival. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not saying that, oh, they came out because I, no. <laughs> like participants reached out to me and they said, oh, this is fantastic. I don't think I get to hang out with this many, you know, people that have a passion for classical mm -hmm. guitar often enough. I wonder if there's a way for us to stay in touch. And I thought, well, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't we just, I'll be happy to help facilitate some of these meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it happened. So the point is like, music is about community, right? We're just taking a slice of that to focus on classical guitar to provide a space for guitarists and music lovers to actually connect with each other. Uh, and, and that in itself creates, increases the motivation to actually enjoy it more, right? Especially when you talk about classical guitar that is significantly more solo playing oriented, mm -hmm. these kinds of events really help you understand that, hey, I'm not by myself. It's not just my teacher, you know, myself against the world. It's, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's kind of like the best thing. And of course, you know, just being able to see some, you know, great performers and learn some really fantastic information from these great performers who have decades of experience and they're actually eager to share these, you know, secrets. There are no secrets and they will tell you themselves, but they're more than happy mm -hmm. to give you whatever, you know, they can do to help everybody just enjoy it more or make the more out of it. Nice. That's really beautiful. Well, if, uh, if anybody wants to uh, join this community, we have two festivals, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the Okanagan Festival, July 4th to 7th at the UBC Okanagan campus, and the Vancouver Festival from July 11th to 14th at the Kaplan University. So if you're interested, you can uh, go to vancouverguitar.org and just scroll down a bit and you'll find some uh, information about how to get the ticket. All the details. Yeah, all the, <laughs> all the details. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, okay, it doesn't look like there's any uh, any viewer questions. So uh, why don't we call it there? Is there any final things that you wanted to say before we before we end it? I hope to see you all there. <laughs> well, actually, oh, sorry. I uh, actually there is uh, one question I just uh, saw. Okay, uh, right. Uh, which music piece best describes your favorite meal and why? My favorite meal and why? Okay, but let me, described let me as a musical, like which which piece describes your favorite meal? Let, first of all, I need to figure out which one is my favorite <laughs> meal. I'm a foodie, so I don't really have a like. I, like, oh, this is my favorite one. Um, You know what? I think I would probably. I don't know if I have a favorite food that uh, that I can think of right now, but I can tell you the sensation and the piece of music that matches that sensation when you're having just that you know, uh -huh. great meal. Um, the Shoro Number One by Villalobos. Oh yeah, nice. It's just you know if you're having a great meal, yeah, you put that in the back. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you're just good to go. Nice. I would say. Okay. And then there's uh, one more question. Uh, which color would you choose for a dragon to ride into battle? For a what? If you're gonna ride a dragon into battle, like you uh -huh. know, like breathes fire, you know. Yeah. What color would that be? Yeah. Oh gosh. Um. Let me think. What goes better with a stash? <laughs> I'll go with green. I don't know why. Green? All right. <laughs> probably, it's probably all the plans that I'm seeing on the background that I can come up with a better question. Yeah. Majestic. All right. Um, okay, one more question coming in. Do you feel like classical guitar is growing already as its own thing? Or do you feel like um, the things that you're doing are fighting against the problem that the classical guitar has in terms of its status? Say that one more time. So, it's so, so its basically, like, thing. um, are is guitar growing on its own in a natural way, or do you kind of have to like fight against a, a pushback against trying to develop it in in like a positive forward direction that you're trying to make it happen? I, yeah, for that, it's a that's a interesting question. Let me think about it for a second. I think it's it, it's not either or. I think. Um, it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, guitar, classical guitar is still not like so well known that um, that it has like so many things going against it. Mm -hmm. um, if there's one thing that is fighting for is popularity amongst other instruments that are considered as serious uh, for a like considered you know seriously considered as a as a music education yeah um this is kind of what i find as a teacher more than anything not more i think i find more evidence as a teacher um as a performer i can't say that i've like you know conquered i've done so much that i'm like oh i know every single you know issue with, mm -hmm. with performing i don't know anybody who can confidently tell me that um but in terms of like what i see with teaching is that at least in, in vancouver and in toronto if somebody is thinking of having a serious music education and picking up an instrument, you tell me what's the first choice? Piano. Typically. And typically, violin. Right? Yeah. And then violin. And then? Anything else and then guitar. <laughs> anything else. And, and so my point being is that if somebody wants a serious music education, they will go for piano or violin, mm -hmm. maybe voice, maybe. Um, but guitar is kind of... It, but nevertheless, if you ask... People in, um, I mean, people that own music academies, mm -hmm. they will tell you that, and you will notice that guitar is one of the most popular instruments. Yeah. Not as popular as piano, per se, but it's very popular. Like, it's definitely more popular than, you know, flute or even voice at times. My point with this is that it's very popular, but not necessarily for serious things. Mm -hmm. Not to say that not being serious, there's anything wrong with it. Like, I think it's great to just do things for fun. But that's the nature of what people go into uh, for, for guitar, I guess. Um, in classical guitar, first of all, I don't think enough people know what classical guitar is to even ask for it. Um, in my experience, when I was, uh, I after my master's, I taught for four years before I moved to Toronto for my doctorate. 
And in those four years, I managed to only teach classical guitar. Um, and it was mainly because when students come to me, I, of course, they will also learn pop music. They, they will, I think it's actually very valuable mm -hmm. to do all the styles of guitar. Um, I would just essentially push them a little bit towards the path of note reading. And then we would do chords, we would do songs. Uh, and then we would, so of course, at the same time, do some classical guitar tunes and work them through some of the RCM stuff. Yeah. And by the time they could play these different styles, they typically find the some of the classical stuff a little bit more engaging in the sense that they find it more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so back to the question, I guess, is that are there any challenges or something fighting against it? Um, it's popular enough that I don't think we have to worry too much about it. I think the responsibility falls on the classical guitarists, like teachers and performers, to just be open and share it more in whatever space they can. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, and plus, classical guitar isn't just Bach or Soar, yeah. for those who know a little bit more of classical guitar, right? It's like there's all kinds of styles mm -hmm. and all kinds of genres across all kinds of, you know, times and periods that you can pick. Like, it's literally just like going to the one of those stores that they have like you know 50 flavors and you can combine them however yeah, many sure. millions of ways you can right it's just it fits all tastes mm -hmm. is my point yeah and i think that's kind of one of the nice things because at the end of the day it's just it's just an instrument that functions a medium of expression at the end of it great well thanks so much it's honestly really nice to chat with you again and uh yeah i'm looking forward to working with you at the at the festivals too so yeah. my pleasure take care and uh thanks dj yeah see ya <laughs>